How precious, yeah. Oh, thank you, yeah. Okay, now the Lord, let's start with verse 1 of Psalms 23. Let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then we're going to jump over, not yet, but we're going to jump over to John chapter 10, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And so there's something interesting about sheep. How many of you have ever raised sheep? Raise your hand. (laughs) Uh, Okay, if you wouldn't mind, just bear with me. If you've ever raised sheep, would you please raise your hand and keep them up? Keep it up. How many of you continue to raise sheep? (laughs) Nothing else needs to be said about sheep. (laughs) Sheep aren't the brightest lights on the tree. (laughs) So for you flock lovers, uh, we raise sheep of which we no longer raise sheep. At the height of our sheep deal, we had about 175 ewes. And um, sheep are interesting creatures. I, I grew up, I'm, I'm, I'm still crawling out from the shame from f- family and fr- f- friends that are cattle people when you, you know, cause sheep are what? The poor man's cow. Right. And so, you know, when I started raising sheep, I did it for our project in Bulgaria because I wanted to kind of get up to snuff. I, I didn't know anything about sheep. And, and so for I don't know how long do we have them, babe, eight or eight or nine years and, until we went on our sabbatical. Then I sold them all. Um, but sheep aren't the brightest light on the tree or they are so smart that nobody can figure them out. But, but the truth is, is they're not the brightest light on the tree, which just doesn't mean anything. It's just, there's some interesting characteristics about sheep, though, that speak to us. Because turn to your neighbor and say, you are one. Okay, now, did I just say you're not the brightest light on the tree? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is, We're referred to in scripture as sheep. And um, it's important for us to understand some things about sheep for us to get it. First of all, sheep are followers. You lead sheep, you don't drive them. Right? That's, That's really important. And so as followers, and we are followers, if if Jesus Christ is our Lord then we follow him. Am I correct? We don't assume, you know, the wheel. He is the one in charge. Now that's, that, that just really affirms in all of us that we're not the brightest light on the tree because from time to time, I try to take the wheel. How about you? Instead of Jesus take the wheel, I try to take the wheel, right? Um, And we all do that from time to time in different areas of our life. Let's never forget that we're followers. Everybody say follower. I'm not talking about, you know, from a business leadership perspective necessarily. I'm just talking about in the big picture of who we are in light of who he is. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. Amen. Um, In the book of Psalms 100, of which I thought today was the proclamation of the word from that portion of scripture one of the last verses of that chapter says that we're the sheep of his pastures the lord is my shepherd i shall not want let's go ahead and put that up on the screen go to the next verse yeah he makes me to lie down in green pastures everybody say green pastures what do green pastures speak to Certainly don't speak to pastors in August in southern Idaho. Without irrigation, pastors and pastures in August in southern Idaho, what color are the pastures in southern Idaho in August? Brown, right? 
So, so there's some thing about this shepherd that I think it's important for us to get down on the inside of, inside of us. And, and, and here's another thing just about sheep. Sheep as a domesticated animal <clears throat> are one of the most defenseless animals there are. In fact, when a sheep has very much wool, when it gets on its back, it cannot ride itself by itself. Isn't that crazy? Sheep have about the only thing that a sheep has as a defense mechanism is a hard head. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about you now. <laughs> Are you with me? I mean, I wouldn't know, but they say that if you take a stick and hit a sheep on the head, it doesn't do a whole lot. I, I can't confirm if I've ever tried. But sheep can be hard-headed. They can get something in their, they, they can get something in their brain that they want to do something, and they'll just keep keep going and just keep doing it right because they're followers here's what's interesting is sheep you know one one sheep sheep can start running everybody else will follow without any thought of where they're running and they literally can run right off a cliff and you're sitting there going just how stupid are you and then I just think about that transfer to us as humans. If we're sheep, we have some of those similar characteristics. We'll follow what everybody else may be doing without looking where it may lead or where, if it fully grows, what it's going to look like and produce in our life. But I love this here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me. He, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Why still water? Sheep, sheep typically won't drink out of water that's moving. Why? Anybody know? Pardon? Yeah, there is a chance that if for whatever reason in moving and drinking in wet water, once a, once a sheep's wool, especially unsheared, once their wool gets wet, and if they get in water where they lose their footing, they're just going to drown. That's all there is to it. So he, he leads me beside still waters. And I, I just want to reaffirm in our, in our heart, we're still in Easter. This is the fourth Sunday of Easter. I just want to affirm in our heart and just highlight, not only is he the risen Savior, you know, we're working our way to Pentecost, but not only is our, is our risen Savior, but he's our shepherd. And he's not a shepherd. He's the best shepherd. And this shepherd, but here's what's interesting. He's also referred to as what? The Lamb of God. I mean, if you know, he fully identified with mankind, 100%, 100% God, 100% man. And, and we love when we celebrate communion, when we celebrate communion, how many of you know, it's, it's the blood of the, not the shepherd. It's the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Let's continue on there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Next verse. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So, so leave it, yeah, leave it right there. Leave it up there. Well, so here's what's cool about the God that we serve is, is, is he's not, he, he, he didn't start creation and then go, okay, you're all good. See ya. I'll see you in a, in a, in a few millennia. He didn't do that. He wants to actively, and I, I want us to get a hold of this, that he wants to actively be involved with bringing us and keeping us to a state of health. One of the things that a shepherd does and is required to do, and Bulgaria has been a, a wonderful country for me to just see this aspect of a shepherd, is, is that the shepherd's job is to take them to good green pasture not old stale stubble, right? Say this, say, God wants me to grow. 
God wants us to grow. And, and, and here's the thing. He knows exactly, to the T, exactly what I need and what you need. Amen? I mean, he knows, he knows exactly. So, so that aspect of being sheep just knows this, it just needs to understand this. I may think what I want is what I need, but how many of you know he knows what I need, whether or not I want it? And there's a difference there. He knows what I need, whether or not. I, I think sometimes we have this idea about God in our consumeristic world that we live in, in, in a world that it seems like customer service is the only thing there is in business. And, you know, that's, that's cool. But how many of you know that, that God, as our shepherd, he knows exactly what I want. And, and there's times that he can even say, eat it anyhow. Why is that important? Because without it, without that, we find ourselves in a place of ill health. And one of the things that anybody knows that raises any kind of livestock, the first thing, the first thing that goes in a domesticated livestock animal when they're not healthy is their reproductive capacity. That's the first thing to go. They're not going to get pregnant and they're not going to bring something to the table. And I don't mean necessarily to eat. I just mean that if it's a, if it's a horse, they're not going to get pregnant. And they're not going to have a little foal. If it's, if it's a cow, they're not going to bring forth a calf. If it's pig, piglets, you know, whatever. Reproduction. So stop and think about that. Can I go there for just a sec? How long has it been since you've reproduced yourself how long has it been since you've reproduced yourself in bringing, being a part of bringing somebody to Jesus Christ? And if it's been according to what the stat says, the stat says that if you're a Christian and have been born again for two years or more, you've never led anybody to Jesus Christ. Why is that? Think about why that is. And I, I sort of get it. It's still not right, but I sort of get it. When you become a Christian, what changes? Your allegiance, right? Your likes begin to change, right? You don't like to hang around the, 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 maybe even the same group of people that, that maybe kept you in a, in a place of where you didn't come to Christ. So I get it. So then you, you, you give your heart to Jesus Christ. He becomes the Lord of your life. You then start maybe uh, inculcating a uh, uh, regular church attendance and, and, and hopefully the people that are in church are nice people, right? You, you enjoy being around that. And then after a while, within two years, the psychologists say within two years, the average Christian no longer has themselves inserted into the world of sinners and they don't even know any other non-Christians well enough to be able to impact their life. Think about that. And after that, in 10 years, they've never led anybody to Jesus. I just wonder if, if maybe it's because our diet has changed our health. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Thank God they're green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores. Everybody say restores. He restores my soul. So, so just think about this so far. All parts of man were, were a tripart being, right? We have a physical body. We have a soulish realm. And we have a spiritual realm. So far, every part of man, the good shepherd, sees to it that every part of man has what we need to be in a place of health, right? And so in that, then the next verse says, and they, yea, though I, sorry, he restores my soul. I'm sorry, I missed the last half of that. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. How many of you know that there's more than one path in life? 
He leads, but, but, but the good shepherd leads us in the path of righteousness. In other words, other paths, when we start to stray, when we start to do whatever, listen, if we're connected and, and, and we, we're, if we give in to the fact that we're followers, it's not me leading the bus, it's not, or driving the bus, it's not me having my hands on the wheel, it's me following. He leads us in the path of righteousness. What's interesting about a, a uh, sheep is that when they eat, they eat in such a way that their vision begins to get uh, impaired. That's why they can eat in their very next step, they can step off a cliff almost and not even really realize it. And you go, oh, what happened? Because you weren't paying attention, right? None of us have ever done that in life. Amen? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Verse four. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So a good shepherd, um, a, a good shepherd in doing their job, a good shepherd realizes that there's some places that you have to go through to get to the other side. Because on the other side is what? Other good green pasture, right? or still waters. And so, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, everybody say through. through. What it doesn't say, and, the, and yea, when I set up residence in the valley of the shadow of death. I want to encourage you. You may feel like from time to time, if you, if you haven't yet, you will. Be, and you will more than once. There'll be times in our life that it seems like things are dark and things aren't good. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's actually a real place um, where, where David wrote this. But yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Yeah, go ahead up there, guys. For you are with me. Say, he is with me. How many of you know Jesus said that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, right? You are with me. Your rod and your staff. What's the rod and the staff for? Discipline and protection, right? That shepherd's crook, right? It's got the, got the deal on this. Not so Bull Peep can have a nice picture. That shepherd's crook is, is something that it extends the ability of the shepherd to move you if you need to be moved. Of course, that rod, you know, what, what you'll find in Bulgaria, you'll find typically a, a shepherd will have several different things. They, they, you don't so much see a staff as in Bo Peep staff very much anymore. But what you do see is you see a long, thin stick. And that long, thin stick is something that a shepherd will use to be able to just sort of correct and lead um, the, their, you know, whatever uh, away. You prepare a table before me. Uh, let me just say, your rod and your staff, look at this. They come for me. Let me ask you a question. When, it, when the last time that the Lord sort of corrected you, did it comfort you or did it make you mad? Good question, huh? Children, sometimes it's, it's interesting. Sometimes we as parents... If we discipline our children and they're still mad, the discipline hasn't been finished. Amen? One of the things that we endeavor to do, um, don't know that we always did it perfectly, and, but we didn't, we didn't, anyhow. If at the end of discipline, your kid runs off to their room and slams the door, I'm just going to give you some insight and some wisdom. The discipline, it's not discipline yet. They're just mad. And, and you, haven't, you haven't finished what you need to do as a parent. The end of discipline always should be, not that somebody's mad, but that a person is sorrowful for what they did wrong. Does that make sense? So, so I say this, and, and I know this is, this is, this is non-politically correct language in the current environment that we live in. But I'll say this. You need to discipline your child until they're happy. And what I mean by that is not slap happy. 
not, I don't, I don't mean some superficial happiness, but something that the discipline went down deep in terms of in their heart it says your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If a kid just stomps off to their room and slams the door, parent, you've, you've, you, you, I know this is tough ground to tear, tread on, but I'm just going to say if they, at the end of your discipline, they stomp off and go to the room and slam their door, you haven't done it correctly or fully. Amen. Say, I love you, pastor. And I hope you go on because <laughs> it sure is an awkward moment, <laughs> but it's the truth. Okay. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So listen, it's important that we as believers, as sheep, uh, the sheep of his pasture, it's important that as humans that we really realize that, you know what? He knows better than I do what I need and his correction for where I've made a mistake or where I'm wrong, instead of it causing me to bow my neck at him, because listen, when we bow our neck, you know what we're doing? That is the ultimate of arrogance to the God of the universe to say, to think that I know better than you. To put ourselves in a spot to just go, okay, I'm not saying that you necessarily like it. Who likes to be corrected in terms of, you know, bring it on. <laughs> but there should be something in our disposition that says, Lord, you know best. And Lord, I'm going to obey you. And then, thank you. Dret and I have been watching a... Um, uh, video series. It's interesting. I got to tell on Pastor Alex. Still do well on the media, Pastor Alex, after I tease you just a little bit. Dret and I have been watching the Waltons and we started with season one and season two. And I don't know how many, and I told Pastor Alex that and he goes, the Waltons, never heard of it. <laughs> I said, you never heard of the Waltons. He goes, nope. He goes, what is it? I said, have you ever heard of this? Good night, John boy. He said, yeah, I've heard of that. I said, that comes from the Waltons. <laughs> Anyhow, what's interesting is uh, obviously it's set during the depression and it's, you know, it's, it's whatever. We've just, it's just been kind of fun for Dret and I to watch that again. And, and we really never watched it when it was on. I, I uh, it was I think during the early 70s. But anyhow, over and over again, some of the children come back to their mom and dad. And after maybe correction or discipline, you know, the, the, there'll be a moment of, you know, whatever. But then always they come back to mom and dad and say, thank you for correcting me. I was so wrong and please forgive me. That disposition is the disposition that we need. I, I'm not saying that if, you're, if you ever get mad because you're corrected of the Lord, then you're horrible. No. But let's put ourselves in the disposition that says, Lord, do you know best for me? And so I just welcome, Lord, whatever, whatever needs to be done in me, I just welcome you to do it because you know best. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my, of my enemies. And, and as, as Leah mentioned that <clears throat> the good shepherd actually doesn't remove all enemies. The good shepherd is, is, is just there that when there are enemies, you're not alone. And thank God for that. And whatever attack that maybe you've ever experienced as a Christian or as a person in life, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, whenever you've been attacked, because listen, um, you know, we, we can find ourselves as human beings in bad situations that we created because we're not the brightest light on the tree. Amen. I'm, I'm trying to keep you a little bit light here. We're not the brightest light on the tree. When we ever we assume the wheel, how many of you know, it's only going to end in tears right? But then there's times that we find ourselves in bad situations because there's been an attack. Had nothing to do with who you, uh, what you've done. But listen, it ha all has to do with who you are. That's really important. Predators attack prey because of who the prey is and who the predator is, right? And sometimes the attack that maybe you'll experience in life or that will experience is simply because you are a child of God. Mm -hmm. It's just all there is to it. It's who you are. 
And the predator likes to go after certain prey. And just because you're a Christian, right? You Sometimes you can get attacked for things that you never thought of. But listen, thou preparest, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What is that? How many of you know that in the middle of even a, a tough situation, we can do what James said? Rejoice when you fall into diverse temptations. Right? When things happen that are, that are not good, how many of you know that he can still prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies? Which just simply means you can sit and have a wonderful dinner even though around the outside there are predators waiting to just pounce, right? Isn't that comforting? Then it says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. So this is, a, this is strictly a shepherding uh, reference here. Is one of the things that shepherds would do is pour oil on the top of a head, on the top of a head of a, of a sheep. And then what would happen is, is that oil would begin to coat the face. The reason being is when a sheep eats, they eat with their head down and they can get poked and they can, they, they can come up against rocks that do this that or the other and what that oil does is that oil goes goes down and keeps flies from landing and producing maggots right so it keeps them keeps them healthy even though they're not aware of what God's doing one of the things that I've always said I'm sure it'll never happen cuz I really ultimately won't care but I've always said this when I get to heaven, I would love to talk to God and say, God, could you now show me? I would love to watch the video of my life of where you intervened and I was never aware. Amen. Would you kind of like to see that? Yeah. Then I get thinking about it and it's like, ooh, maybe I don't want to see it. <laughs> my mom has always said this about me. She says, your angels are going to rejoice when you die. She said, for the first time in their life, they're going to be able to take a rest. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, cool. So, so thou anointest my head, you anoint my head with oil. That's so powerful because God is at work, even when you're not aware he's at work. While you're eating, while you're doing something else, he's at work. That's so comforting to know that even... Even in a, in a season, in a time frame that you just don't feel like anything's going anywhere, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Everybody, everybody say overflow. John 10.10. 10. We're going to read in John 10. Well, maybe not. We're running out of time. But John 10.10 10, um, talks about that we've been given. Um, the thief comes not for, but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it. How? More abundantly. How? more abundantly, or to put it in Psalms 23 reference, that your cup overflows. He's not the God of just enough. If he was, I'd still be thrilled. He's not the God of just enough. He's God of more than enough, right? Thank God for that. And then the three women will end up, the end of verse, verse six ends with the three women. You know who they are, right? Surely, goodness, and mercy. <laughs> will follow you all the days of your life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Wow. In the book of John, I just encourage you to write these down. John chapter 10 verses 11 through 30. I encourage you to read that. One of the things that Jesus said, so he gets called on the carpet again with the religious leaders of the day. And, and Jesus then just comes out. And when he starts using shepherd and sheep sort of language, it kind of, it kind of began to get the ire of the Jewish leaders of the day. And then he just comes out and makes a broad, broad proclamation. He, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And, and then he goes on and talks a little bit about what a good shepherd does. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that next week or something. But a good shepherd does a lot of things for a sheep. First of all, they lay down their life for their sheep. Jesus contrasts in that portion of scripture the difference between a hireling and a, and a shepherd. 
he, 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 and that's a whole other discussion in and of itself, but the hireling is the idea that when push comes to shove, when things get tough, hireling's going to run away, but the good shepherd doesn't. You know, it, it was one of those things in the, in the, in the, during the era, which wasn't very long of cattle drives and stuff like that. Uh, when you rode for the brand, you, here was the understood thing, you were branded. When you rode for the brand, you were branded. That, that meant that from the time that your job started, that you rode for the brand, that meant that didn't matter what happened if you had to end up giving your life on behalf of your job. then that's just part of the job. When you rode from the, for the brand, that meant that you were branded. As opposed to when the going gets rough, then leave, Right? The idea about this good shepherd, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And, and he, he says that he, you know, would, he was speaking prophetically in one portion of that, that he was going to lay down his life uh, for that. But then he said, my sheep know my voice. And I just want to close with that. Do you know the voice of the Lord? We're getting ready to come into Pentecost, which, which is um, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place to where we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And that we have to exercise ourselves. If I could even say it this way, we have to practice at hearing from God, right? We do. We have to get good at hearing from God. We have to get good and, and, and sensitive to hear his voice um, because there's times that God speaks in that what kind of a voice, that still small voice. That's just subtle, right? Uh, there's times that with me, I'm sure with you, God's had to use a four by four, right? He starts out maybe in the still small voice and oops, we're clueless. And it's all right. He, all right. It's kind of a strong whisper up, oh, still clueless. And then that's whatever. And then, then all of a sudden he has to pull out the two before and go whap. And you go, oh, was that you? The thing is that Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of another shepherd they'll not follow. One of the things I just want to encourage us in is that Jesus being the good shepherd, I just want to encourage you. It doesn't mean there's never any difficulty. It just means that he looks out for and he'll never be deficient on keeping you healthy. If we continue to follow, if we continue to submit and in doing so, you can rest assured you're going to be healthy, and in being healthy, you're going to be a reproductive, you're going to be a person that is able to reproduce, and that if I could say it this way, life comes out of you. Amen? Cool. Let's stop right there, and bow our head and close our eyes this morning. If you're here today and you've never submitted yourself to the Good Shepherd, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give an opportunity for that to take place. So think about that for a moment. Have you, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Or maybe I'd like to speak as well to those that maybe you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, but really and truly you find yourself that you're not, you're not following God anymore. And what I mean by that is, is you haven't necessarily abandoned God in the sense that you, you, you've told him to get out of your life, but you've just lived life in such a way that you just find yourself that you're not submitted to his lordship. You're not submitted to his shepherding. You're not hearing his voice because you're just not spending time with him. And maybe for you, today would be a day for you to rededicate your life to Christ and get back on track in following God. For those that maybe be watching by screen, I just want to encourage you. I'd speak to you too and ask you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Or do you need to surrender and, and recommit your life to Jesus? And if so, just stick with us here. Um, and we're going to um, pray here in just a moment. But I'm going to ask for a show of hands here just shortly. And I want you to respond by lifting your hand to say, I'm not a Christian or I want to be, or that you would say, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. And then I'm going to have us all stand up. I'm not going to call you forward other than to say this, that at the end of service, we'll have stuff available for you that we'd love to give to you get it on the way out or come up front and we'd love to touch base with you to just help you in, in your walk with God. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, 
Is there anybody in here this morning you would lift your hand and say, I'm not a Christian. I've never surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And he's not the shepherd of my life, but I want him to be. Or you would say, I need to rededicate my life to the Lord and get back on track and become part of the fold once again. Anybody at all, by lifting your hand, you're saying, that's me. Pray for me. I'm not a Christian or I need to rededicate my life to Christ. Anyone, anywhere, I'll just look around. For, I see that there. Thank you, sweetheart. Cool. Anybody else? All right, let's all stand up. And for those of you that are maybe watching by screen, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. And if you raise your hand in here, we've got information that we'd love to give to you. Some of us will be available at the end of service as well. At the very least, stop by the foyer and get some stuff there. Up front over here, we have uh, two prayer things on both sides of our, our uh, sanctuary. Um, if you need prayer for anything else or you made a commitment to Christ, we'd love to just touch base with you. So let's, let's pray this together. I'll lead us and repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Would you be my Lord and Savior? I want to declare you as my God. I want to follow you, Lord, all the days of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for accepting me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen.